Well, hello everybody and welcome to part four of our video <clears throat> on the Sansui AUX1. So <laughs> we're starting right out uh, focused in on the scope and I'm going to show you why here. Um, I have a signal generator connected to the auxiliary input and I have the uh, preamp output connected right into the scope. Nothing's, nothing fancy. And uh, I just have a sine wave on there. So let's turn it up and see what it looks like. So as you can see it's a pretty nice looking sine wave, huh? <laughs> of course it's a really nice looking sine wave if you look more carefully. Um, take a look at the frequency. No, your eyes do not deceive you. That is a one megahertz sine wave. That's right. There is a one megahertz signal passing through this amplifier. And watch this. That is a one megahertz square wave. <laughs> and if we stretch it out, if you take a look right now, I am on 20 nanoseconds per division. And, and, and mind you, this is a one megahertz signal. You can see our rise time here is only about 10 nanoseconds for your square wave. So any of you who are kind of wondering why all of these high frequency transistors were being used and everything, um, I think you can see now why. Um, the frequency response in this amplifier is phenomenal. You can see now mind you that little tiny bit of ringing uh, part of that has to do with this amp is doesn't have any of the shielding on it that's the cable that I'm using I'm using regular 50 ohm coax um, so I have the volume wide open and I'm driving it with about a 1 volt uh, RMS drive signal and it's a one-to-one -one output for the most part um, so there you have it. <laughs> uh, you're seeing it with your own two eyes. So I really think this amplifier is ready for us to go to the next level with it. Okay, let's just do a little experiment. We have our one megahertz signal fed into our amplifier and I'm coming out of the RCA uh, output, the uh, preamp output of the amplifier into this little piece of wire. <clears throat> just comes out of the RCA jack, a little piece of wire, and I just have it ran across the top of the radio. And if I turn the radio up, let me turn the microphone here, and I'm going to turn the radio up, and you can hear all of the garbage that it's picking up from the transformers and the bench and everything. You hear that? Now watch when I turn the volume up on the amplifier. pretty cool. Sorry about the loudness. I'm going to show you here. Hold on. Let's just get you at a different angle here. I have the other channel, so it's only hooked up to the to the left channel, and the right channel is still connected to the scope. And let's see if we can't uh, turn off some of these lights so you can get rid of some of the glare. Okay, here's the radio, as you can see. And take a look at the scope over here. Watch me turn the volume up. And it, you can see it just squelches it right out because the radio is actually picking up the one megahertz signal from the <laughs> amplifier. So you're really getting one megahertz through this amplifier. Isn't that a cool experiment? And just for fun, there's 20 megahertz. <laughs> yeah, you're seeing it. I don't know what you ever would need an amplifier for this to do this because uh, that's a little higher than I can hear. <laughs> but for those of you who are really into this sort of thing, there, there you go. And I don't think you're going to get any better than this amp. Um, 
how many people can say their amplifier doubles as a <laughs> radio transmitter. Pretty ugly looking square wave at this frequency, but because you're kind of getting into that 10 nanosecond uh, rise time limit of the transistors and the circuits. But you know what? For all the stuff that's in the circuit here, by the way, I am using the jump switch. Um, you, you can't get this if you, the latency of traveling through the amp, you're starting to, the actual physical limits <laughs> of the law of physics will prevent that circuit from conducting this. Like if we shut the jump switch off, you can see how much it attenuates it. So that jump switch, there's an example of what that jump switch does. The jump switch bypasses the flat amp and pretty much uses minimal circuitry to take the line in and pass it straight through to the amplifier output or the amplifier input, I should say. So that's the big difference. And that's why that jump switch is so important um, when you're looking for purity and sound and not having anything coloring the sound or anything. So jump switch on, jump switch off. And again, you know, look, look at the rise time, how it changes here. If we change the just change it you could see your rise time gets pretty crazy um, after that the slope gets really sharp but anyway put the jump switch on and <laughs> you could see it comes right back so all right I just thought we'd play a little bit and uh, have some fun with this thing okay here is the setup um, it looks kind of crazy, doesn't it? But I am not taking any chances after all the work I've done. So we have the amp modules plugged back in and soldered in. Everything's connected. The whole amp is put together for the most part. And uh, I have a 8 ohm dummy load connected to the speaker terminals. I have all the controls set, like we're going to listen some to something coming in on the auxiliary input jack volume controls all the way down. I have the oscilloscope, which you can probably just barely see there in the corner. Okay, if I shut this off, you can kind of see it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to turn on the power down here, and we're going to slowly dial this up. Now, I've disconnected the main power rails from the amplifier, and I've tacked in these inline fuses and literally there is only a one half amp fuse in there so really if you have you figure if you put a maximum of 70 volts in there let's say and I don't think there's that much going in there but let's say there's 70 volts 70 volts at a half an amp is only 35 watts and remember we have three uh, parallel transistors that are capable of handling over 100 watts each so there's 300 watts on each complementary side so I'm way under what those transistors will take before they'll short out and burn up so the thought process is that little half amp fuse in here will blow long before anything goes wrong um, if we're not running high power it will be more than enough current to bring the amplifiers up and, and allow them to bias and everything so really what we're going to do is I'm only on hundred millivolts per division uh, on the amplifier, or I mean on the oscilloscope. So what we're really going to look for is some kind of DC offset, and I'm, I'm a, kind of expecting it to be way off. Because remember, we just put new pots and new components. We rebuilt everything on this thing. So uh, really all I care about right now is that it powers up. <laughs> and I do have a signal generator connected up. And if everything turns on, I will attempt to turn the volume up and see what happens. So, here we go. I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to turn this on. And we're going to start dialing this up. Now, here is the voltage. And this isn't a super accurate voltmeter, but it will at least get us to a point where when we're in the green, we know we're in that 110, 120 volt range, which is all I care about right now. This is monitoring the current going through the whole circuit. So let's bring it up and see. So, okay, 100 milliamps. 
what I'm looking for is a really fast jump in current. Remember, the capacitors have to charge there. I heard a little relay come in. It sounds like the low voltage supplies are in. Okay, I'm right at about 100 volts now. Oop, did you hear it? And look, I have some DC offset on the one channel, but not on the other. Let's keep going up. 800, about 700 milliamps, settling down. Okay, we're right at about 125 volts right now. And we're still staying under that one amp idle current. And one amp is what's going into the variac. So, I mean, the losses of the variac, the transformer, everything combined at full power now is only drawing less than one amp. So, uh, that doesn't seem too bad. Now I have a signal generator connected. I don't smell any smoke and I don't see anything. Let's push our luck, huh? Feeling lucky today. So here's the scope. And uh, I'm going to turn the volume up slowly. I have a one kilohertz tone on here. Let me set my time base. Okay, for one kilohertz, and all right, one channel's getting some, whoop. Well, we had it for a second, and then it tripped the uh, protect relay. That makes sense because, again, right now we're sitting at about 120 millivolts of uh, DC offset on the one channel, and if you notice, this one was way off on your DC balance. You could see the not good. It's half waving. So there's some craziness going on yet, but the good news is we're getting sound coming out of the speaker terminals, <laughs> which is way better than I ever expected to have the first try. So now what we're going to do is we're going to flip this thing around and we're going to turn it back on full power again and we're just going to see what all of our DC offset and bias looks like. I mean, obviously, DC offset, there it is. Um, looking at this uh, scope, we can see that there. But the actual bias could be way off. And if the bias is way off at 100 millivolts, um, you know, that low of a thing, you, that might, you might just be seeing terrible crossover distortion because the amp is just, the transistors are turned off or so far out of whack. So let's go and see if we can do that. Maybe that'll cure the whole problem, or maybe we're taking everything apart and checking it again. Okay, so we have the amplifier connected and turned on. <clears throat> and right now, if you look at these two test points, and they're not hooked up right now to the meter, but up here you have these little header plugs in the corners, and the two outer pins are actually your test points for bias. So you just take your meter and connect it on there. If you read this this uh, instructions, it's really dumb the way they described it. They're saying to um, between the emitters of power transistors TR701 and TR703 between TP pin. So what the heck does that mean? Well, it means up here. So you don't need to take the bottom of the amp apart or anything to do bias. <clears throat> the bias adjustment is the one that's down in the board here and then the DC balance is the one that's here up on the front and we're connected right now for DC balance and I'm actually just letting the amp warm up for a little bit to make sure that we can get it to balance. Um, and again uh, what I found was when I turned it on, this thing is so sensitive that if you turn the volume up or do anything at all, those little half amp fuses are just so tiny that they'll pop the fuses. And that's what was wrong. We popped a fuse. So I put a new fuse in. We're not going to turn the volume up right now until we get everything balanced and biased. At least get it kind of dialed in where we want it, uh, roughly. So let me move you over to the meter, and then we're going to just look at DC balance. Now again, I do not have a load connected to the speakers, and I just have the speaker terminals connected right to the 
DC voltmeters. So let me get up there and we'll show you here what we got. Okay, for starters, we're not too bad. When I took the old pots out, I measured them and I set the new pots to the same value resistively. So it should be somewhat close. And you can see one of them is closer than the other. They want zero millivolts and this one's 24 millivolts. This one's floating around 10. It's still varying a little bit. The thing's only been on for about five minutes. You really want it to cook for a while before you do this. But let's just uh, adjust it and see what happens. So I'm adjusting the top meter first. And it is adjusting. So that's looking close to zero millivolts. And then we'll do this one. I'm going the wrong way. 50, 50, 90 rule. And there's zero. And this is going to just keep bouncing around. Now one of the problems that I noticed with the design of this output section of this amplifier is that the bias transistor and the driver transistors are not sharing the heat sink with the outputs, which is, in my opinion, is a no-no. So really, the all of the bias circuit, it can't thermally track with the output transistors so you don't because you don't have thermal coupling between the outputs and the drivers and really that would be a really good uh, mod to do to this amp but you'd have to pull transistors off the board and run wires and yeah, I don't know that that's a good idea but that's really what should have been done um, but we'll see how it is and you can see it drifts around on, on us just as we're sitting here talking so, uh, let's see here. I'm just going to keep zeroing it till it stops messing around. It's not drifting a whole lot. This top one's staying really nice for us. This bottom one's still misbehaving a little bit. It's creeping around, but looks like it's finally thermally settling, which is good. And uh, these heat sinks are staying just ice cold right now. So that looks pretty good. I'm going to just wait a few more minutes. I'm not going to bore you while I sit here and do this. And then we're going to get this connected up to do the actual bias adjustment next. So the next thing, we're going to stay on the meter, but when, when we come back, you'll actually be seeing the bias connection. Okay, we're connected to bias, and we're actually pretty close. Um... Now, the one thing I will tell you on that balance pot, that's a 10-turn pot, and what was in there was a 1-turn pot. And I'll tell you what, I was barely touching that pot, and it was really moving it. You saw how it was adjusting it. I can't imagine how you would ever have balanced this with those little single-turn pots. So let's go in there, and we're going to do the bottom meter first, because it's close. We're going to bring it in. And you want 25 millivolts on that test point. And that's good right there. Now we're going to do the top meter. If I can. There we go. How's that? Nothing like using a 10 turn pot on these. There we go. I think I'll buy that for a dollar. And again, the bias, I mean, if you're within a couple of millivolts, it really doesn't matter because it'll go all over the place as this thing heats up and cools down, especially uh, the fact that these things are not thermally coupled. Um, so it will have a little bit of drift, and there's plenty of uh, leeway on this. The idea is you don't want the you want the bias to be high enough to keep the transistors from having crossover distortion, but but you want it low enough that you're not putting such an idle current in there that you're just generating unnecessary heat that's not going to do you any good. Um, that's the problem. If your bias is turned way up, a lot of times you can't hear the difference in the amplifier. You can still hear it if the bias is too high. The amp sounds fine, but it's going to run red hot. And the difference between a cool running amp and a hot running amp is having the bias properly set. Um, but if you go too low with it, then you start seeing that crossover distortion because the transistors are actually turning off in between the cycle, you know, the zero crossing point. 
So it's kind of a balancing act, but follow the instructions and you can't go wrong. So there we go. This amp's ready to test, I think. Okay, the old girl's all back together. She's turned on, everything's set up. And just do the little once over. I don't have the, I have one cover here left to put on this one here. I'll get that put on. But it's all reassembled and cleaned. And uh, we're set up right now. I'm just playing around with it. But I want to show you the clipping on this thing, how it clips. Uh, here we go. All right. We ready? She's nice and warmed up. Let's bring it up and let's check for clipping. Remember, we're on 50 volts per division because I'm on my times 10. And we bring this up. And look at that. <laughs> Talk about perfect symmetrical clipping. I mean, good grief. You could set that with a micrometer. It's so accurate. And the amp's running really cool now. So we're going to do some burn-in test on it and uh, check everything out. And uh, then, we'll, then we'll do some other testing. All right, let's talk about frequency response. <clears throat> Feast your eyes on this right here when I turn the volume up. Now, I'm not going to leave it up for very long because this is really hard on the Zabel network and all that. But I just want you, I want to prove a point. What's that say over there? <laughs> yeah, you're looking at 100 kilohertz. And uh, it pretty much did that without breaking a sweat. So this amp's got an amazing frequency response. Okay, let's look at rise and fall, fall of our square wave. <laughs> How about that? Looks more like a computer clock, doesn't it? So let's uh, let's change the time on the scope here, so if we can see what we're what we're getting. Okay, I'm looking at a captured waveform here because I don't like leaving this on really long during, um, you know, because this is really hard on the amp. I actually have a square wave going in there. I am not running at maximum power, but I'm very close to it. And uh, we're right now at 113 watts is what we're driving. And this is a 160 watt amp, so it's still got more headroom. But you can see the rise time even up to that 113 watts. I'm on one microsecond per division. And you can see how fast. Now this one has a wee little bit of a ring on it. Uh, this channel here ain't even sweating right now. So uh, you can kind of see they're still, they're a little bit off from one another. I don't have this, them centered on the line or anything, but you can see this is a very, very high speed amplifier. Okay, let's just see how clean 10 hertz looks like. And we haven't, we don't even have the uh, distortion meter on yet. We're just kind of looking. And there you go, it's 10 hertz. No sweat. <laughs> So, this amp has an insane frequency response. Okay, time to do the obligatory, obligatory frequency sweep. So, let's turn that on and see where we're at. And the idea is we don't want the amplitude to change with frequency. So, you can see I have it, the voltage level set so that it stays two divisions. And you can see how flat the response is. Um, from 10 hertz up to 20 kilohertz, it's, it holds very, very well. And that's really what we're looking at. Beautiful. Okay, so we got a signal here. <laughs> and it's really not even worth trying to measure total harmonic distortion. That, what you're seeing is just noise from the cables and whatever. It's unmeasurable. And really, until you start almost to hit clipping it it doesn't read anything so it just kind of gives you an idea of how low the distortion is on this 
Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a final look here at the inside all put together with all the covers on. And while you take a quick look at it, I'm going to just make a quick comment concerning uh, harmonic distortion. You know, when you hear the word distortion, when it comes, you know, to the subject of audio like this, um, the main one that most people are talking about is THD, or Total Harmonic Distortion. And really, although it can tell you how the amp can perform as far as, you know, the power supplies are balanced and, you know, there's no, no major problems, really the test that you do for THD, the typical one, is to feed a 1 kilohertz sine wave. And a 1 kilohertz sine wave is a very pure signal. There's no, it's not a complex waveform. It's what we call a simple waveform. And when you see harmonic distortion on that, the harmonic distortion is a harmonic with respect to a pure fundamental sine wave signal. So really, things have to be pretty bad to be able to get harmonic distortion like that. Because um, it has to change that sine wave somewhat while it passes through there. And even though a amplifier can have good characteristics um, with that test, you know, most amps will pass that test pretty well. Um, there's a lot of things that can affect it though. Uh, for instance, <laughs> You saw me using that Keithley 2015. Uh, if I use the built-in signal generator in the 2015, the lowest, uh, the lowest um, distortion I can display is about 0.02% total harmonic distortion because the actual sine wave coming out of the internal uh, signal generator in the Keithley actually has its own <laughs> distortion uh, component right in that fundamental. So when I use the Rigel, the DS1, uh, what is it, the DG4162, there you go, I had to look at it, I have it connected to my GPSDO oscillator and I get an extremely pure waveform out of that. So it is an absolute spot-on perfect one kilohertz undistorted sine wave and when you do that <laughs> this amplifier just doesn't show any distortion whatsoever but the point that I'm really trying to make is not how good a piece of test equipment is or anything like that but the difference between 0.02 percent total harmonic distortion and 0.002 percent is inaudible um, there are people that claim that they can hear the difference, but you have to look at it from a different perspective. They're not really hearing that. They're probably hearing some other form of distortion because really all distortion is, THD, when you're doing the one kilohertz sine wave test, is really a comparison of amplitudes. So the distortion is going to be a harmonic of the fundamental waveform. So if you have a one kilohertz sine wave, then your fundament, your your harmonics will always be a multiple of that, like two kilohertz, four kilohertz, whatever. And the amplitude of that harmonic compared to the amplitude of the fundamental, the one kilohertz tone, that's how you calculate your distortion. And the difference between 0.02% and 0.002%, the amplitudes, regardless of which one you're listening to, are so minutely, infinitesimally small difference that even a dog can't hear that difference. Your ears physically are limited that they can't just... the sound pressure, <laughs> the atmosphere itself, the air puts too much into it that you will never hear that. Um, people that claim that they're hearing a difference in that small of a, of a difference of an amplifier, of a, of a distortion, really are hearing something else. And again, 
I believe what they're hearing is that Tim distortion, which a lot of people today don't even believe in. They don't understand it or they don't believe that it has really any bearing on sound. But actually, even though it's not very measurable and there's all kinds of conflicting information of how to test for that type of distortion, an intermodulation type distortion, the main difference is in clarity of sound. And it's not, it, it, I can't explain it, you can only hear it. And again, I am a real skeptic when it comes to a lot of these gimmicks. You know, I hear of people burning in their cables, you know, like getting an RCA patch cord and hooking it to some special machine that puts frequencies and voltages that somehow massages the wires to me. <laughs> I'm not kidding you guys. This, this is real stuff. Uh, you know, and all these special speaker cables that are many, many thousands of dollars. And these things to me have no scientific bearing and I can't hear any difference even though maybe there's people that say they can and I'm not saying they're not because again, maybe my ear isn't trained to pick up the minutia of that. But I'm just saying I can't tell the difference. However, intermodulation distortion, I can hear that. And it's not really even a high frequency versus low frequency thing. Even if my ears are limited in frequency range now compared to how they used to be, I can hear a difference in clarity. I mean, even when you have a low intermodulation distortion amplifier that's a fast amp like this, even the bass notes do have a different amount of clarity to them and really before you pass judgment on that you know on that comment you know I, I would say you know in the right conditions with the right speakers and the right source material you know you have to have good you know garbage in garbage out if you don't have a good set of speakers and you don't have a good uh, either an audio you know CD player or a good turntable or something you, you're going you're not going to hear it but you literally can hear the, the difference in clarity. It is a very different sound, you know. What is the signature, you know, spectral signature of a guitar pick coming in contact with the strings when somebody's playing a guitar in a recording? What is the spectral signature of the bow coming in contact with the strings on a violin? You know, those are the minute sounds that aren't always there in every sound system that's out there and honestly until I actually heard it for myself you know I had the had the fortune of being able to work in a high-end audio store for a while in college and you know it kind of not only opened my eyes but it opened my ears to that sort of thing now one thing I've never been able to make any sense of is the cable thing you know suspending them on little wires or spending 20 grand on speaker wires those kinds of things I think you're trying to just squeeze more out of it that you're already there <laughs> you can't go any further um, but and then and again that's my opinion you know it's I've I've I took a different path in audio I took the technical path you know I like working on them I like seeing how these things work servicing them other people their hobby is not repairing them or building them or designing them their hobby is listening to this sort of thing so to them they they're more refined in that category than I may you know and I'm more refined in the technical category I guess is the way you would say it but I mean I just thought that was interesting and I guess that kind of explains the purpose of why Sansui went through all the trouble they did to design this very special amplifier. I mean, it really is a special piece of equipment. Um, you see the kind of performance. Uh, you know, the other things that have been on the bench, you've noticed, you know, once you get 25 kilohertz or so, it, things start going <laughs> sour pretty quick, on a, even on a really high-quality receiver. But you just saw what this thing did. I mean, it's, it's here. It's on the video. So um, I just think that was all interesting, and I'm not saying anything to poke at anybody. I absolutely don't believe that. I mean, I think, you know, there's things I don't know. Uh, let's just leave it at that. And until I experience it and learn it, you know, I, I'll scratch my head, you know. But I will say that I have, I have seen the difference of a high-speed amp versus a non-high-speed amplifier, and that what that 
Tim distortion means and does. And that's kind of how I, how I hear it anyway. So I think this is going to be a great thing. I really wish we could record this thing in a way that you can all hear it. But again, like I said, once you add compression to the recording, uh, the limitations of the microphone that's recording it, the limitations of my speakers, which are middle of the road, they're not anywhere near, you know, what this thing was designed to work with. You know, uh, you know, I have a mid-grade turntable. It's a good one, but it's not anywhere near some of what some people have out there. Um, I just can't demonstrate this. You would have to be in the environment and listen to it, you know, under the right conditions. And really, that's what this was designed for. This isn't for the normal person that just wants to buy a good sounding stereo. And don't get me wrong, I love the sound of the Pioneer gear. You know how much I've done on this channel with Pioneer and with Kenwood and with uh, Marantz, you know, and the other Sansui, the more traditional type. I love the sounds of those. I mean, that's, that's it's my go-to sound. But I will say this is special and it is different and... Uh, I know there's people who really will appreciate this, and that's why I decided to take this project on and put the amount of time in it. I'm never going to make a, a nickel off of this job. I mean, I didn't do it for that anyway. But uh, you really can't do a restoration on this for profit because the amount of care and time is way more than you could ever charge. Well, here's the final parts count. <laughs> could see all the stuff that had to be replaced in this thing um, and yeah I did relent uh, a couple of a couple of the viewers emailed me and kind of shamed me into replacing these relays um, I do want to talk about these a little more because I know I've had a few comments on them let me take one of them apart and we'll take a quick look so the first thing I want to talk about is my poor ability of drawing <laughs> so what we have is a this is just a drawing of a pair of contacts that you would see in a normal relay and if you really look closely to the contacts these are always made of of copper or brass or some sort of conductive material and the contacts themselves are a hardened kind of metal and they usually have some sort of a plating and that plating is always made out of some special conductive alloy but the plating also is designed to resist tarnish and to uh, kind of be able to resist the heat of arcing and so forth but the the more important thing I want you to look at is that the way the contacts are shaped is they're kind of curved kind of pillow shaped on the top and even though the contact may be, you know, three or four or five millimeters in diameter, the actual surface of the contact that touches is much smaller because of the curvature of the face of the contacts. And when a contact, this, this material here is kind of springy, so when a contact pulls down, it kind of slides around, you know, like in a curve, and kind of rubs the two surfaces together, and that partially helps keep the contacts clean but it also decreases the surface area of the actual contacts because again since it's curved you can't have the entire diameter of the contacts touching one another so as you can see that does put a little bit of limitation on the amount of current they can carry and it also changes the contact point to one area where all of the the current is flowing through and this is how a, a typical relay works now the relay that we saw that they were using in this Sansui receiver is the same type that they were using in the Marantz 2500 receiver if you recall and those are harder to get and <clears throat> a lot of times they're replaced with this type of relay but those contacts are called bifurcated contacts and the whole purpose behind that is instead of having one large contact that's covering at one area and only a small part of that area because it's curved it actually has two smaller contacts that are in parallel so even though each contact is a little bit smaller diameter than this if you combine the actual contact surface that actually touches one another 
it's actually a lot bigger surface area and it spreads that current across a wider area. And that's the importance, that's why they use those bifurcated contacts. So for the sake of science, I have dissected one of the ones we replaced so that you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Okay, so I took the little spring off and I desoldered the little wires so that we can remove this. And if you look, you can see you actually have two contacts on each side. They're in parallel, so if you look on the front, it's tied together, it's all one. But there's actually two contacts, and they're coming in contact with the actual, the bottom part, which is a larger surface area. So when this touches, you can kind of see you have a lot more surface area and you're spreading that heat and that contact surface across more of this down here. The other thing I want you to take a look at is the material that they're using. I don't know how good we're showing it on the camera, but if you see this bottom, it's kind of like a gold color, and depends on what type of contact and what type of relay this is, but some of these actually use actual gold plating. Some use a brass type plating or nickel. Uh, it's diff the different, they have different alloys depending on what they're trying to do with the relay. And you can see they can get a little bit tarnished. As you can see here there's a little, two little spots on there where the relays the contacts have been touching. But it's not, these ones aren't too bad and actually probably would still have worked. And you can see these ones are still absolutely perfect. They look nothing wrong with them. After 30 some years, they're still in perfect condition. But if you notice, these are a different color. These are made of a different material. Now mind you, the coating that's on these contacts is very different, um, you know, very thin I should say. And if you clean this, or if you use a little piece of real thin sandpaper, and I'll kind of show you some of the things people use. So for instance, this is 2500 grit sandpaper, which is pretty fine. That's about as fine as you're going to see. 2500 grit. And you can hardly feel anything when you rub it. But people will use that. Uh, sometimes they will use these little things called burnishing tools. All of those sort of things were never designed for these types of co contacts. If you, if you try to scrape these off with this and clean them, that really thin coating of actual contact material is going to get rubbed away very easily. And a lot of times when you get tarnish on there, the tarnish is actually a re chemical reaction of that coating changing and when you rub it off yes you get rid of the tarnish but you get rid of that coating as well and the metal that's underneath it doesn't work very well with uh, with arcing with actual making and breaking of contacts it will it will pit very very quickly and ruin the relay that's why I never recommend anybody clean these where where this comes from okay this is a legitimate thing people will use stuff like this on some contacts, uh, and those contacts are on a thing called contactors, not relays. A contactor is usually a much larger device that's designed for switching heavy loads. In other words, they're designed to switch in high current. These are not. Technically, this is supposed to come in and then you put high current through it. And as long as the contacts are closed, it can carry a very substantial amount of current. But if you switch that high current, for no, in other words, if the volume of your amplifier is turned up real loud, and then this closes on that, it will draw an arc, and that arc will wear off that, that material very quickly. That's why I keep telling everybody in a lot of my videos, don't turn the volume way up and then turn your stereo on because when that high volume switches in, you're switching a high voltage, you know, it could be 30, 20, 30, 40 volts, depending on if it's a really high powered amplifier. You can be switching that voltage right into a low impedance, 8 ohm, 4 ohm, whatever it is load. And, and because it's a reactive load, it can actually be even lower than that. So instantaneous current can be very high 
which will damage these contacts. A contactor has a very thick material on it and when it gets kind of pitted you can you can burnish them with this type of material and you can do that a couple times they're designed for it these are not um, the only recourse for it is when they start to go you replace them um, if they get a little bit of dirt on them from you know uh, from age or something a little bit of tarnish if if it's a cleanable tarnish literally just a little bit of contact cleaner and I don't mean deoxid deoxid leaves a leaves a residue you want contact cleaner that's designed not to leave any residue okay so I'll show you like this CRC stuff QD contact cleaner okay quick drying leaves no residue see that that's what you use. You use a little bit of that with a little piece of card stock like a, you know, like a cue card or something like that and soak it and just if if it's cleanable, it'll just come right off. Uh, if it's not, throw the relay away and replace it. <laughs> Again, you can burnish these and when it leaves your bench, it will work perfectly, but I guarantee you it will develop resistance in a very short order. Um, as it oxidizes with the air and so forth because you removed that coating, that protective coating, and you're done. So I just keep getting so many emails and comments and things about relays, so I just wanted to share that all with you. So either it's a, it's a go or no-go. Either the relay is good enough to keep, which these ones probably were. I tested them. They didn't test too bad. Um, but who knows how long. You could see these ones, now that I have it apart, you can see that it's starting to develop a little bit of that pitting or not pitting but uh, that tarnish see that color how it's not shiny gold so anyway I hope that was interesting to you I just thought I'd kinda go over that once again okay so I gave this thing a listening to a first listen and I will tell you <laughs> I used my digital audio player to drive it um, I have not connected a turntable to it yet we're going to try that later and we may also use our uh, reverse I RIAA uh, adapter and I'll kind of maybe show that later in the video here too but I'll tell you when I first turned that music on and listened to this thing the hair on the back of my neck stood up um, I don't think <laughs> Dave Brubeck's take five will ever sound the same again to me after listening to it through this amplifier um, you know, I really was a bit surprised. I didn't really expect this to perform the way it did. It is absolutely dead silent. And, you know, there's no tone control on this. You don't have a bass and treble. You don't have a loudness switch. You really don't have anything. It's, it's a volume control. And uh, the sound that comes out of this, it just doesn't need changed. It's perfect at every volume level when it's quiet. The other thing I noticed is... The volume, a lot of this I have to explain to you because I can't record it on a microphone with the compression and everything. You would never ever hear anything. It would just sound like the YouTube algorithm. Um, but as you turn the volume up on this, it's very smooth. In other words, I can have the volume way up like this and it's not that loud. And then all of a sudden it starts getting really loud in the second half of the volume. So you have really good control over the sound. Then you push this little button down here <laughs> called the jump switch. You see where it says jump? And when you press that switch, the first thing you'll notice is a very marked decrease in volume level. Um, because what's happening is, you remember in the front here, we had what's called the flat amp. That's the amp that has these little knobs on it. And... It's, it's kind of like your line level amplifier. So here's the chain of uh, how things work. You have the moving coil preamp section. That feeds into the moving magnet preamp board. So if you select over here, if you select moving coil, it's, it routes your phono input into the moving coil boards, which were the ones furthest in the back you know, furthest back. The output of those, well, let's look at the schematic. 
Okay, so I tried to highlight this a little bit. So here's those little tiny relays that everybody makes all of the fuss about here. You see them? And when you look at these, the way this works is when these things are in their normally closed position, okay, so none of these are energized, we come into our phono stage, okay, and the phono stage you have two sets of jacks, phono 1 and phono 2. You can actually connect two different phonographs to this amplifier. This first relay switches back and forth, and there's another set of those relays um, down below here for channel 2. So this is just showing one channel. So this first relay switches between phono 1 and phono 2. And remember, rather than using like a 4066 um, analog switch, you know, like an electronic switch, this is a mechanical switch which is very low impedance and when it's switched together very low noise and it introduces since it's a mechanical connection it introduces n virtually no distortion that's why they went with this um, so anyway when it's in its normally closed position you're on phono one jack and when you energize this one it pulls in phono two so that's how you select your phonographs from there it goes into this one which is your moving magnet and moving coil okay and in order to do what it needs to do they're using two relays for that so there are two separate relays and by the way each one of these relays is a dual dual pole so this is this one this is one half of one of the relays and this is the other half of of that relay so just to show you guys that are new to the relay thing so if you look right here, you have these two contacts, or these two little terminals here, see, on the end, and those connect to this little coil down here. So that represents the coil, and when we energize the coil, that's what pulls this in. And then if you notice, there are six other contacts, three here and three here. Well, you have your common, which is your actual switch here, which is this terminal, and then you have your normally closed, which would be this one up here, and your normally open, which this one would close when you energize it, right here. And then for the, for the left channel, so there's your right channel, and then left channel, you use these three. So this represents this half right here. And so anyway, you have two of those relays, so one here and one here for the two channels, uh, half and half. And what this does is in moving magnet mode, okay, the first, it's, that's what it normally is and it's normally closed. So what it'll do is it'll bypass this board up here, which is your moving coil board, and it'll pass it right through this relay, right through this relay, and then if you follow up here, it goes straight into your input of your moving magnet board. So we're in moving magnet mode as it's shown, shown right now. However, if you push the moving coil button, so in other words, next to your Phono 1 and Phono 2 selector switches, there's two little tiny push buttons called MM and MC. If you go into moving coil, it will energize these two relays together. They will both pull in, and then it will route this down here, up here, and into the input of the moving coil board. It'll then come out of the moving coil board, go down here into this second relay, and it'll get routed through here and up into the moving magnet again. So, rem so what I'm trying to show you is this moving magnet board is used even when you're doing using a moving coil uh, phono cartridge. So that's that's how this circuit works. So you either use both of them or just one of the boards, but you never use, you know, this doesn't directly come out and go into the amplifier. Okay, looking a little closer at the big picture, we can see once it comes out of this right here, it goes down here and this is kind of your switching network. 
and these are the push buttons on the, along the side of the amp next to the volume control where you select uh, you know phono one phono two tuner auxiliary tape whatever and this kind of all that does is it switches in the appropriate set of cont or jacks to the input if you select phono it's going to route everything up through these relays and if you select anything else it's going to route the signal directly from that appropriate jack through these switches and up to what we call our flat amp and the flat amp is where we feed into um, for instance when we're in phono mode it comes out of the flat amp through these and or out of the uh, moving magnet uh, preamp through these switches and up into the flat amp and when we look at the flat amp once again this is your line your line level preamp and if you notice there is nothing to it I mean it's it's a very basic uh, one to one ratio it doesn't really have much of an amplification factor it has a very slight amplification factor to it and really all that is to over is to overcome any losses in the circuit but it's a uh, pretty straight through circuit and then it goes out and that would feed out to your pre outs and so forth and this is what actually drives the main power amplifier so it's an extremely simple circuit on the front end um, now the reason I'm explaining all this is we have this little switch called the jump switch and when you throw the jump switch that we talked about what it essentially does is it takes the output of your switching selecting network and directly bypasses this in other words instead of going into here into the input it actually puts it out all the way out here on the output and if you notice your volume control uh, is not located directly on the circuit board if you see here it's kinda outside of the circuit board so you can see the little dashed line that indicates what's on the circuit board there's your volume pot it connects to the board but you have this jump switch that actually will either route this volume pot through here or it'll route it around here and up to the output directly and why do they do that well by eliminating this circuit you actually have a very direct output coming from this preamp into your power amp so I had a few comments on the last video why do these get so hot and why do you need a phono stage with such a hot output on it and that's why there's actually enough energy coming out of these phono stages to actually drive the power amplifier directly and there's enough gain in the power amplifier to be driven by a smaller signal so that's why they do that and that's why this thing doesn't have a whole lot of drive to it now as you can imagine by removing this flat amp from the circuit by pushing in that jump switch you're going to lose some gain that this that this little circuit is going to introduce so that's why when you hit the jump switch the volume drops way down however all of this is bypassed so you actually have a lot less noise so it gets even quieter and as you could see the distortion and noise was almost nothing with the flat amp but this flat amp even as simple as it is adds a tiny little bit of coloration to the sound now some of you may like that sound some of you may not all I can say is with and without the jump switch you hear two different sounds um, when you're listening to it um, it's a little bit brighter when you have the flat amp in the circuit and it's a little bit clearer when you're in the jump switch mode so just depends your listening preferences the other thing is you don't get as much maximum volume again with the jump switch in so that's a really unique thing that they tried I think it's really cool now another curiosity that uh, a couple of you have brought up in the comments is back to this uh, moving magnet section the the 
the head amp for moving magnet. And it's this little circuit down here we were talking about. Remember I kind of said, I think some of this has to do with, uh, you know, like this is like a bootstrap feedback. And we have these two transistors sitting down here. And they're situated between the, the JFET pair and the common. And one of them is a PNP and one of them is an NPN. And no matter whether this swings positive or negative, it's always going to hold these FETs above ground. It's going to kind of put a little bit of bias on here and kind of hold it there. And then when you have this little feedback in here, it's going to try to hold <laughs> everything stable. And I believe this is what Sansui was alluding to when they're talking about their diamond differential circuit. I think that's what this is. The, the thing that they're trying to, uh, I think, achieve by this, and again, this is all speculation, so jump in here and correct me when I'm wrong. But I think what this is all about is different phono cartridges have a different sweet spot for their for their coupling impedance that they like you know especially with when it comes to capacitance and with the actual resistive impedance and a lot of higher end um, amplifiers the way or phono stages the way they'll deal with it is by having a switchable capacitance in the front so you can actually change a little switch if you go back to my video long long time ago on the Harman Kardon PM 655 I think it is um, it had switchable capacitance on the input uh, of the phono stage and the reason they do that is the better you couple that cartridge to your phono stage the more the flatter your response curve is going to be from your turntable and the clearer the sound is going to be and the more accurate it's going to be. What this is trying to do is eliminate the need for that by using this little, this can actually be positive feedback just as much as negative I believe and therefore no matter what kind of cartridge you put on this, whatever whatever the output impedance of that cartridge is, because most of these moving magnet stages typically designed to terminate at around 47 kilo, kilo k ohms 47 k I believe and this doesn't really care <laughs> it will adjust to whatever cartridge you you couple up to it so the idea is this technically if it works would be the ultimate you know front end for for a phono stage and I think that's what that is and again they gave it that term diamond differential circuit and I think that's what they're talking about there's two different parts of the amp where they're using that diamond differential circuit and this this is one of them here is the in the phono stage okay from the flat amp and the jump switch depending which way you have it switched you go directly into your main power amplifier and you can see there's your input and really this is a pretty common design um, the only thing that you do notice that's a little bit, a uh, uh, little bit different is that they use these two current sources for the positive and negative, and uh, so of course you know having these constant current sources driving into here, you can imagine you know how stable this amp should be, and I think that's part of the reason. Now that I've tested the amp and listened to it and checked it out. Even though they don't couple these output, these driver transistors and bias transistor and so forth to the heat sink with the outputs is because I think with this circuit back here, it does such a good job of holding everything where you set it that it's not really necessary. And again, sounds crazy, but that's what this circuit does. So again, they've... What it looks like is the engineers at Sansui, you know, at first I was skeptical and I kind of, a little bit in my mind, I was kind of throwing stones at this amp. I wasn't very happy with the layout. I wasn't really happy with the choice of their circuit design. And I kind of thought to myself, maybe this thing is one of those things where it's legend kind of outspeaks the reality. But really, after 
working on this and listening to it, I get it now. I kind of understand what the engineers at Sansui were doing when they designed this circuit. It's really pretty ingenious in my mind. I, I'm really, I'm really impressed with it. And I, all I can tell you is the amp does not run very hot, even when you're running at high volumes. It's dead silent. It tracks beautifully, um, as far as you know when it's when you first turn it on versus when it's been warmed up for a while. It doesn't seem to change the coloration of the sound or anything, or drift. It just locks in and works. It just, it, it works. And it's, again, it's the circuit design. Now, as you saw, <laughs> this amp can, can run at very high frequencies. If, if you recall from some of my earlier videos on some of my other more traditional the receivers we worked on, you know, some of the Pioneer gear, some of the other Sansui gear, and so forth. You notice that when you start getting up around that 25 to 30 kilohertz range, you start to get some pretty weird looking distortion. But I showed you how very plain and clear we could pass 100 kilohertz with, without even trying, uh, all the way through the output section. And it's all because of those special choice of transistors that they used in this. And that's why it's so important when you replace the transistors in these, you have to use uh, transistors with the same specs. And I mean not just gain and not just voltage and current rating, but you really have to pay attention to the transition frequency of those transistors. They all work together. And this is a chain. And this chain will only be as good as its weakest link. So if we don't, you know, one transistor in this circuit that's the wrong choice, the rest of it's all worthless and you wasted a lot of money and time uh, to do all this. So last but not least, let's talk about the oscillation problem and what I think about it. Um, if it really matters what I think. <laughs> Uh, I'm not trying to talk as an authority because, again, man, I did one of these amps and, you know, it was a real challenge and it was a learning experience. So I'm nowhere near an authority. But um, at least from what I was able to gather from this restoration, the reason this thing had problems with oscillation, number one was the routing of the grounding. Um, number two was the fact that these two board, these boards up here, this section is isolated ground with respect to the rest of the amp. So what I mean by that is if you look over here, okay, here's these jacks, okay, and these jacks right here, if you notice, everything but the phono, all the commons are tied together. All the commons here are tied together, power amp in. These all go over and go across the page, and they go to actual chassis ground. But if you look at the phono ones, look at the ground of these RCA jacks. They do not tie down here. They come up, and they go into here, and they are switched in all in here. So essentially... And by the way, this is not tied together at this point. Right here where it comes across, you see, it crosses over here. There is no tie point. So it goes straight through and goes into this grounding, which follows along here. This ground and this power supply is ground isolated from this part. Because there's a difference in, in grounds, if you don't have the proper routing of your wires, if you have any noise whatsoever generated by these contacts on these little tiny relays or anything like that, it's, you could set up a, a situation where you can have a parasitic oscillation take place. Now they corrected that uh, by redesigning that motherboard that these plug into, which unfortunately we have the old version on, on this one because this is one of the older amps. But by rerouting your grounds properly, by using a good solid set of contacts, by making sure the uh, those snubber capacitors, I'll call them, uh, which were those black film capacitors that were bad, 
by having those at the correct values in the correct position and cutting the lead length as short as possible. That's why I use those tiny little NP0 capacitors. They're so small that they can't act like an antenna and pick up any noise from outside to, to create oscillation. Also the lead lengths are extremely short. You notice I kept them really close to the board. And they're the correct value that Sansui chose to work in there. If you'd follow those rules, this is a really stable amp. As you saw, I was able to run it. I did my DC balance. Um, I've read things online where they say not to even turn the amp on without speakers connected to it because it could oscillate and blow up the outputs. No danger. This one, I ran it with no problem without any speaker, any load on the output, nothing. Think about it. When you turn the headphone jack, when you listen to the headphones and you turn this turn the speaker switch to off, you drop out the speaker relay <laughs> that's on that speaker terminal board, you disconnect the amp from the load. So that's not a true statement when people are saying you can't run this thing without uh, speakers connected to it. Not true. If that was the case when you listen to your headphones you would blow up the output of the amplifier. So you know I learned a few things about this thing as well. So that's how I dealt with it and you saw the results we were getting I was driving this with radio frequency I mean remember on the flat amp we were getting <laughs> pushing 10 10 megahertz through that stupid thing and it passed it right through um, and it never oscillated even though I was driving it at such a high frequency it didn't trigger it 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 was rock solid so uh, that's the key to this amp I think and uh, I think this one's going to work for a very long time. If ever there was a time, I wish there was a way you could hear this amp for what it is, this is the time. This is one of those situations where there's no amount of recording and no amount of playing back. Because even if you had the perfect recording of this and you played it back through your stereo and your amplifier and your speakers, it would not reproduce the sound the way this amp does. And a lot of naysayers out there, um, you know would say that that's not possible and things but in this instance I usually side with those people I'm a I'm really a science person I kinda wanna see it and measure it and know it or I don't believe it but I heard it with my own two ears as bad as my ears are <laughs> I could hear the difference this amp is something special it's been said to me by multiple viewers who own these and have kind of emailed me and, and messaged me and said this amp is very special they all use the word special I agree it's a special amplifier so again uh, I may do one last little clip here before I close out the video and uh, kind of show you a little bit more about how to test a phono stage when you don't have a turntable sitting on your bench uh, maybe we'll go over that and then we'll probably call this one a wrap and uh, we'll be moving on to our next project. Okay, so I just finished repairing this turntable for someone else. And uh, so I figured what better place to test it than on the amp here. Again, guys, I'm really sorry that I can't play anything decent for you guys as a demo on this amp. But the last couple times I tried to even put 5 or 10 seconds of something... Um, the YouTube copyright algorithm picks up on it right away. I mean, like I said, it's it's almost to the point of ridiculousness now. I mean, I understand protecting copyrighted material, but wow. Anyway, um, you'll have to take my word for it that this amp is just incredible the way it's working. Um, maybe I'll hook up my digital before I kind of take this all down and everything. Um, maybe I'll try to connect the digital audio player and put a good set of speakers on this for you and do a quick recording um, of some of the YouTube library, you know, <laughs> canned music, I don't know, uncopyrighted stuff. Because I hate to, like, le end this video and not let you at least hear something, you know, hear sound come out of it, even though it won't be anything near what it really sounds like. Um... I was going to do a little video, a uh, little clip at the end of this video, talking a little bit about phono stages and kind of how how you can test them on the bench. But I think that's a lot better video to have separate. 
uh, instead of tacked onto this one because I think it would be useful for people in general that want to work with, uh, you know, testing phono stages on amplifiers. So that'll be a separate little video in and of itself. And I'm going to end this here and maybe I'll tack something on the end for you to listen to. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Just depends. I'm really busy with work and I have literally just a stack of things to go on the bench here. So kind of getting short for time. But wanted to get this finished up and let you all know that everything's great. I thank you all for all your support on this project. I've had so many emails and help from everybody. I can't even imagine. <laughs> uh, can't even tell you how much people came out of the woodwork to help with this project. So I really appreciate you all know who you are. Thank you all. And uh, hopefully I can reciprocate sometime. Anyway, take care and uh, peace, joy, happiness, and good health to all of you as always. And uh, stay tuned because there's lots more coming. Take care. Bye-bye.